The sweet grass basket is one of the oldest West African art forms living here in America. You know, my sweet grass basket was passed down from my grandmother, started back in the 1800s. The basket weaving craft came to South Carolina through our African roots. The weaving in Africa is very colorful, very ceremonial. These baskets were made for kings and queens. But when Africans were captured and enslaved and brought to America, the baskets became a tool for work. And so today in South Carolina, the sweet grass basket holds memories of the past. It's a part of our history that we need to reclaim so we can move forward. For order to be using the sweet grass, you have to have the sweet grass lined up together. When you sit down making a sweet grass basket, you start putting that palm up, sweet grass in your hand, and you start working. That's all you got on your mind is love to making that basket for somebody else. Sweet grass basket making come from my mom, from my grandma. It was passed down from generation to generation. Pull them back up. We used to have to sit at home with mom. Mom would say, before we could do anything, she's going to teach us how to weed the basket because this is a part of our culture. What did Nana teach you to make? Basket. All right. I'm currently selling the sweetgrass basket now in the Charleston City Market. Verna Eggston came to the market and she spoke to me about she was trying to get a project, Hands to Heritage, off the ground. Hands to Heritage is a Bloomberg Philanthropies initiative with the primary goal of bringing basket weavers in South Carolina to greater economic opportunities. At Bloomberg Philanthropies, heading the Women's Economic Development Initiative, I wanted to find economic opportunity for the women in the communities where peace must be promoted. Many of the weavers in South Carolina, when you speak to them, they say to you, they feel like they're ornaments of the old South. And as each tourist pass by, they'll have memories of the deepest, darkest times in history, and that would be slavery. The sweetgrass basket represents our circle unbroken and who we are as Gullah Geechee people today. We are the survivors of the survivors of the survivors of enslavement. My mom was born in Beaufort, South Carolina, a Gullah Geechee. And she weaved sweetgrass dolls when she was a little girl. Every single year when we were growing up in New York City, my mom would take us to South Carolina. When I first went to the marketplace, she spoke with one of the weavers, and they made the Gullah connection. And she opened the door that I was, in fact, Gullah. And I said, Mother, I'm going to go back there one day, and I'm going to do something to help these weavers. So this has been a journey that's opened up the history of my people. Gullahs. This peninsula of Charleston was the wealthiest city for well over 100 years, and that's because of the West African people's knowledge of rice culture, and that's why they were captive. That's why they were sold out of Africa and brought here. But the most important and earliest recognizable connection between South Carolina and West Africa are those sweetgrass baskets. For us to understand sweetgrass basket weaving in South Carolina, you can't look beyond Charleston's role 
in the institution of slavery and racism. The city of Charleston budget up till the Civil War was funded in large part through revenues generated from slavery. Through the sale of a slave, we earned a commission. Then there was a head tax for every slave that you own. So when we came forward with an apology for our role in slavery, some people responded, I didn't live back then, I didn't own a slave. What, what do I have to be sorry for? This same corporation, the city of Charleston, founded in 1783, was involved in those activities, the direct administration of the institution of slavery. And you're damn right. We're sorry for what we did. So when people were captured, they were stripped, they were shaved. They anticipated the deaths of so many people that they would overpack those ships. What I know is if we were to drain the water from here all the way back to West Africa, it would be littered with their bones. The other reason I wanted to bring y'all down here is to talk about the folks who got off those ships and settled along the Sea Islands. They're very special to us, the Gullah Geechee. So Gullah was the language of the people, and you still hear it in Charleston today. If you go sit by those sweet mothers who are weaving those baskets, you'll hear it and you'll feel it. There's many of our people who don't feel the connection, and once they feel it, they can weave the stories that need to be told from the dirt. Once one weaver, catches the spirit of that weave from that water. And that weaver comes across that water and connects, oh my God, the stories they'll tell. That's the work I'm committing myself to do. The way we tell this story is to connect the weave. I view the city to be on a journey of reconciliation. We acknowledge that we were a part of the administration of the institution of slavery. We consider this resolution to recognize, denounce, and apologize on behalf of the city of Charleston. All in favor of the question, please say aye. aye. All opposed, please say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Yes. Yes. Along with every other racial disparity that exists, the hardest one to overcome long-term is economic. It's important to really expand our ability for exposure for this incredible work of art that's being produced right here, and also to expand the market of those potential customers uh, rather than just relying on being displayed on a street corner or in a small shed. The mayor thought if he could just work with the weavers, this group who had been placed at a disadvantage for so long, it would be the beginning of healing. So we called Verna with Bloomberg to help expand the market of potential customers. Hansa Heritage from Bloomberg will provide assistance for the basket weavers to get started and to thrive. my piece, I'm adding photos of my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I'm here to show them where I came from and they're showing, showing me where they are going. And that's beautiful. And the vase of this is actually the elephant ear, what I call my flower basket just as well. As in unity for all our ladies and growth, growth into this here for love. 
some of our parents didn't really sit down basically and tell us more about these stories about how life was really going for them to learn more of these things too. I know, but we also got to think about how our ancestors could look each other in the eyes. So they hit a whole bunch of stuff. So some well, of us true. don't have the story of none of our ancestors. You know, that's what's so powerful about the Gullah language. You know, the story of the Gullah, that these folk was on this boat, all these mixed folks and the joining of the language and the Creole. We have a language of our people. Our language lives in the baskets. Our language lives in the way we live. And that was Shame very illiterate people. We spoke yeah. that, that broken language. Mm. We spoke Ebonics. But it, we, we wanted to talk like that most of the time because we wanted them to know what we're talking about. Ain't no, about. Like exactly. Wait, no one to know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Because the story is told in the weave. It is. And it's one consistent. I told the women it's weavers that I've been. Yeah, it's a circle. Unbroken. Yeah. When we talk about this circle unbroken, we have to use the basket to tell this story. Because you're, you have the beginning of the basket, the core, that central beginning piece. You start it in the center. Yeah. Then you make the knot. Yes, exactly. And these are our ancestors. And then it grows out like a wave and all those coils keep mm. going. Mm. Those are the generations mm. and the generations. Because our secrets live in it. Absolutely. So you can look at a basket and know because of the beginning of the core. That's right. Who sewed that basket. That's right. And then you may even be able to tell who their grandmother was. Exactly. Because they're using that same knot. Exactly. That they were taught. And I've mm -hmm. spent time working in Africa. I mean, you can go to any part of the continent and hear that Gullah rhythm. And you hear them singing, hear glory, them sing. glory, hallelujah, since I lay my burning burn down. down. I feel better, oh, so much better. Since I lay my burden down. Wow. I feel the spirit. I feel that. I feel They'll that. come I feel when you that. call them, you know. Woo! Werner has been with our team since 2001. In City Hall, she was so good that we asked her to come to Bloomberg Philanthropies, where she has spearheaded our Women's Economic Development Program. She has done an amazing job. <laughs> When I first met Michael Bloomberg, he was running for the mayor of the city of New York. And it was Michael Bloomberg who said that we invest in women's economic independence. With economic independence, these women can invest in themselves, their families, their communities, their countries. So one of the things about the Bloomberg Initiative is to support partners who promote market activity that brings women to economic independence. We've done that with Gahaya Links, which is a basket weaving initiative in Rwanda that began around reconciliation. The reason to why the work was started was because we needed one event that would bring all people together in order to make a statement of uh, never again. Well, here in Rwanda, the reconciliation process started by a basket. Women, they could come together and then weave together. Healing started with a basket. And so the mayor of Charleston said, I know you work in Rwanda, and I know they have a reconciliation plan and they do in the initiative where they weave baskets to find peace. I thought the mayor and Mama Joy should meet. I call her Mama Joy. Joy is the founder and president of Gahaya Links. I remember telling the mayor, maybe it would be nice if you can connect with Rwanda and you learn from what we did, maybe this problem can be solved. So it became very important for us to bring the weavers together, to look at the weave, to find the stories, to tell the stories. I'm doing bad.
Alaska for nearly almost 50 years. We learned this by sitting underneath the trees, roadside party that they call it. That's what we've been doing, roadside party. Muraho means, uh, how are you? She's saying hello. She used to watch her mother weaving. As a basket weaver, she would be the heart of her family. My mother did it, my grandmother did it, and I believe her mother did too. This is the palm, this is our thread. <laughs> to share these stories, there's nothing we can't do together. This initiative needed to be one that restored our humanity, restored our culture and directly connected us to our royalty. The reconciliation is in the weave. The healing is in the weave. With the ladies from Rwanda, I was just thrilled to be able to get a dialogue going on, because my God, this is what he wants us to do, come together, we as a people. And this is basically why I personally want to really dig into this because it gives me an opportunity to let someone say love in me through my weaving. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I put it all into it. You're blooming. When I arrived at Higher Lakes, just almost burst into tears. It was, uh, it was a tear of happiness. When she entered, I started crying. I could not believe that she was here. And immediately we connected. It showed me that the journey has started now and there's no stopping. Vanessa has opened the doors for all our sisters from America. Please don't cry. <laughs> Just a happy tea, happy tea, happy tea. She's trying to build her cooperative like you. She's trying to bring the spirit from here home. When we no longer have fears to take the risk of being who we are and telling our own stories, that to me is reconciliation. The master weavers of South Carolina and the master weavers of Rwanda created and exchanged peace baskets. One set was carried by the weavers of South Carolina to Rwanda and presented to the central government, while another set will be permanently placed in the Charleston International Airport. So you folk have been invited here today to see the baskets of weavers who came together and spoke words of reconciliation and peace around an initiative we have named Hands to Heritage. So we're gonna do it on the count of three. We're gonna start now. One, two, three. We did months of work to remove the layer of shame so that people had the freedom to speak of war, to speak of tragedy, to speak of pain, to speak of racism, so that they could weave. And what we found was the weave actually got better. The weave got tighter. It was more beautiful. What a beautiful connection it is with the basket weavers to craft a peace basket. It's a furtherance of this ideal of reconciliation both of those baskets will hang permanently in the Charleston International Airport as a gesture of peace and reconciliation. I can see the peace basket going viral because it brings peace, a symbol of reconciliation, a symbol of friendship, and a symbol of culture. Here at Bloomberg Philanthropies, we understand 
that the contribution of women on this planet is really central to our economic growth and our economic survivability. And that's what the Women's Economic Development Portfolio is.